Hello, my name is Justin Vodder. And I'm Ben Cook. Welcome to Solutions to the Social-Emotional Puzzle, a parent program by New Minds Enrichment. We are all things gifted. We offer enrichment for gifted students. We offer professional development for teachers. And we offer, offer parent programs that delve into the aspects of giftedness. Right. And tonight we're focusing on a particular issue that's very important to you, and that's the social-emotional puzzle. However, we do have a previous parent program on productive partnerships. Where can, where can they find that? Sure, if they head to our website at numian.com. N-U-M-I-E-N.com. Uh, and not only does it have the full vodcast online, but the handout is included as well. Uh, speaking of handouts, Justin, we do have a handout for this program mm. as well. Good so thinking. if you haven't printed that yet, we do highly recommend you pause and go print that. It's going to be really yeah, handy. It's almost required. Yeah, I think pause. so. Yeah, There's a lot good. of information in this tonight that you're going to want to have a visual reference. So referring back to the previous uh, pod or vodcast, I, I'll get the name right. Vodcast. Yeah, it has video and audio vodcast. The little, <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> the line on the top is an indication of uh, U.S. education. And so prior to 1988, we had gifted kids, and and everyone realized that, but they're lumped into a category. Right. So they found, Betsy Neidhart, in 1988, that there were six different profiles of the gifted. And so you can't just lump them all into one category anymore. We know that. Exactly. For us, nowadays, it seems obvious, but prior to their research, it was just kind of like, oh, there's this group of kids in the top 10%. They're gifted. You and I know very well that there's a huge variability within that gifted population. Regardless of where you are on this gifted spectrum, no matter which traits you manifest from these six types, the social emotional issues that we're talking about tonight Mm -hmm. can exist across types. Absolutely. For sure. Absolutely. Okay. So yeah, so tonight what we're going to do is instead of starting with the overarching research and then working our way down to the nitty gritty, we're going to start with the nitty gritty because that's where the boots on the ground kind of action's at. Yeah, yeah. So the things that we need to know. We want to be, in our short time here, we want to be really practical for you. So what we've done is we've chosen among the vast amount of information on this topic of social emotional issues in the gifted, we chose three kind of really relevant really recent bodies of research and sort of movements Mm -hmm. and sort of focus down in on the micro level of how these traits manifest and then sort of work our way up. So hopefully as we're going through these different character traits and behaviors and manifestations, as a parent, you can say things like, oh, that's my kid. You know, that describes him to a T. They may not fit all in one category. Um, yeah, in well, fact, you're going to find a couple that might fit. Yeah, we're not suggesting here that, oh, like it's in their genes. Mm-hmm. That's their type. It's oh, not no, that no, no, kind no. of thing. No, and it's, it's very fluid. It can change over time anyway. Exactly. And maturity. So what we want you to have is at least maybe a, a begin to understand and identify. Yeah, this is a complex topic. Mm-hmm. And it would be a cop out for us to just kind of introduce these things and just say, okay, go do some more reading. Although you do have complete annotated bibliographies to all these sources we're talking about tonight but we want did not want you to leave this empty-handed so what are we offering really here sure well once you go through the list of manifestations you say oh i believe this category fits okay so i find a match with my kid yeah we want you to walk away with at least one thing that you could actually say to them to help acknowledge what their social emotional need is right it's all about acknowledgement Mm -hmm. that's basically step one is acknowledged right yeah Yeah, because once there's an acknowledgement and the kid feels validated We'll also give you two things that you can do tomorrow, the next day, the next time you have a break, um, to help foster and support your child's social emotional needs. Okay. And then finally, Ben, you mentioned the annotated bibliography. We have that ready for you. So mm-hmm. these will lead you to a book that is research based, I should say, but it's also incredibly accessible to the layperson. Right. So even if you don't have time to get to the further research for months, even, you leave this presentation with some really mm-hmm. practical actions you can take. But just do have that understanding that we're presenting, this advice we're presenting for each group of manifestation and traits is really just a sampling. Absolutely. Right? If you want more, you're going to have to dig a little. Or, it's just the beginning of solving us. this puzzle. <laughs> yes, and right? that is a big old puzzle. And a big old, got there. old mess. Okay? So once again, the clarifier, starting with the manifestations or traits. So this is the first one. Um, okay. I do want to state as well that, okay, a lot of kids can speak rapidly, and a lot of kids can talk compulsively. Right. Isn't that just kindergarten? Yeah, there, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> this is more a heightened sense. Right. So and in the context of their peers, it just really stands absolutely, out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? Okay. Okay, so with these, you see, uh, one that I want to talk about in particular is the, um, the acting out one. Okay. Because what you're going to have is this kid that needs to move around and needs to be physically okay. active. Okay. 
And so acting out has this kind of negative connotation right. to it. And we don't want these to be negative. Yeah. Um, sometimes people that are compulsive talkers make the best radio hosts. You know what I mean? Sure, so sure. It's, it's about cultivating that talent. That, exactly. What you have. It's all about seeing the positive side of each of these. And like you said, this one's a very physical mm -hmm. group of traits. In fact, what it's even called is psychomotor. Right. right. Your brain is rapidly moving. You're, you want to be actively yeah. moving. Let's face it. Our school system today does not exactly nurture no. this particular <laughs> overexcitability. <laughs> right? Okay. <laughs> Folders are getting signed. Clips are being moved. People yep. are getting in yep. trouble. Yep. Right? So, all right. So a minute ago you said, let's put a positive spin on this. What's some phrasing I can use with sure, my kid? If sure, I've got a psychomotor sure, kid. Well, how rare do you think they hear you have wonderful enthusiasm and energy? Right. I mean, who says that? Yeah, maybe they're a they football hear, coach. They, maybe. <laughs> there you go, exactly. They hear, sit down, shut up. Yeah. Um, so yeah, by acknowledging that and letting them know that you recognize that they have this energy and it is a positive thing that they can use, sure. they feel validated. Right. So something that you could do right after that is you can get them involved in some kind of physical yeah. task. You literally kind of help them harness mm -hmm. that, okay, implicitly. So sure. involving your child in a task doesn't necessarily mean, hey, Jimmy, I'm going to harness your psychomotor over excitability <laughs> by having you... You know, yeah. help me with the shingles. No, I'm, you know what? We got done with the presentation one one time, and there was a kid that was running around. I could tell he was psychomotor. Right. Um, and I, I remember walking up to him, and I said, hey, man, you've got some great energy. We haven't put these chairs that back up. We had the stack chairs. Right. Like, he was the best stair jacker we've oh, ever yeah. seen. And I we bet. had them all back in stacks. I bet. Like, snap, snap, snap. I bet. Uh, and he felt like a rock star. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. So more information on this one can be found. This comes from the book uh, Living with Intensity. Right. And we're going to move on to the next the next category. So uh, once again, hopefully you're going down this list on the left-hand side of the handout, and you're getting a chance to say, oh, that's my kid, and, and find something. Exactly. Can, get out the highlighter. Start marking up things there that you just go. stand out. Yep. If you got that ring three true kids, for you got you. three colors of highlighters. There you go. So. Exactly. All okay. right. This next one is all about the senses. Strong reactions to colors, textures, visual arts. Uh, you mm -hmm. and I actually have a mutual coworker as an adult who we yep. know Absolutely. has described... This very want to give an want to explain yeah. that. Yeah, yes, we both have a coworker who is um, very sensitive to to touch. In fact, growing up as a little girl, she couldn't wear a particular kind of material. Yeah, and there's a tag in the back of the shirt that like just threw her off. And her mom thought she was being obstinate. Yeah, wear the sweater, you know. Right. Um, but in turn, it was because she was so sensitive to that that type of fabric. It was a reaction to the texture of the fabric. Yeah, okay? That's just one yeah. example. It could be colors. Mm -hmm. So it was strong reactions to specific colors, to sounds. This could be a kid who um, really has a tough time in school assemblies or in pep rallies because of oh, all the, the noise, the yeah, stimulation. Sure. Walking into an arcade could be just torture. Mm -hmm. Could just be too much. But on the other side of that coin, they could have a really strong attraction to the visual arts well, or to the opera. Well, we put down a little bit about poetry too, right? right. Just the fact that like, they love the way that words sound and they can play with yes. them. And they might even laugh at the word. You right, know? right. The uh, textures of words and goofy rhymes and things like that. So what do we call this group of manifestations? Well, it makes sense. We call it sensual right. over excitability. Right. And something that you can do to acknowledge that with your kid is you can say, well, I noticed that you like this kind of sweater, yeah. this kind of material, this kind of smell. Right. Um, but this type of sweater, this type of smell, it seems to bother you. Right. I like how that's sort of an open template of a script because yeah. each of these yeah. kids is so unique, right? Well, you know what? And you say a script, and to us it might feel scripted, but I promise you that kid that has never had that acknowledged is going to have their eyes open. Exactly. Oh, my goodness. They, really, they recognize that I don't like tags in the back. And it doesn't make me weird. It just, that's who I am. Right, right. Um, so something that you can do is... You can have that kid create their own area, their own living space. Mm -hmm. This is the example you always get, like, oh, I want to paint the wall black on this wall and blue on this wall. If that's okay with you, let them do that mm -hmm. because they're going to be creating their own atmosphere and you're showing that you you approve of that. Yeah, I mean, they spend so much time throughout the day in school or wherever not in control of their environment, mm -hmm. right? Being ushered yeah. from environment to environment that may or may not sit with them. Yep. So giving them some creative control over their atmosphere to something that really syncs with their sensual overexcitability. And another thing too is you have to understand that they're going to be attached to physical objects longer. Yeah. I've got two girls and the youngest one has been attached to her BB, right? Yeah. <laughs> her blanket. Okay. And she has held onto that longer than the other one. Right. And, and I've recognized that. I don't know if she's gifted yet, but I just, I do know that she has an attachment to that, and that's mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. And it could be things like, that's kind of a, a traditional example, like a, yeah. a lot of kids, but there could be something that just doesn't seem normal or obvious from the outside, right? Yeah. If it's an yeah. older kid who's mm -hmm. attached to a certain object, 
it could seem strange, but we just have to be patient with that. So this is the second overexcitability category. Mm -hmm. And once uh, again, that living in, with intensity is the source for more information on this one. Absolutely. So let's go to the third one inside this list. Um, and this one right here we want to talk about is this intellectual curiosity. And you have to understand there's a drive there. Yeah. Uh, it's a very mm -hmm. it's a very targeted drive, things that they're interested in. Yeah, yeah. And my goodness, harnessed properly, that could be amazing. Absolutely. Uh, um, and one thing I noticed, Justin, just to step back for a sec, is that those sure. first two categories we looked at were sort of very external. Oh, and, true. true. Right? Yeah. Physical. Yeah. This is kind of really, really an internal, mm -hmm. like you mentioned, intellectual. Like uh, that search for truth and justice, sort of like, yeah. and once again, this is to a heightened level, right? Yeah, absolutely. And something that you can say is, my goodness, you really have just a drive. You have a, an ability to stick with things that interest you. Yeah. Uh, we always think about the kid that, let's say, loves to avidly read. So mm -hmm. they'll read the same book 20 times, but won't do their math homework. Right, right. Focus on that positive trait and, and aim for some transference of mm -hmm. that to things that they also have to get done. Okay, so something that you can do, and I want to I want to clarify what this says a little bit because it's got some fancy words in there. Um, what we're saying is, you have a ten year old, and the gifted kids grow asynchronistically, meaning different areas aren't growing as fast. So they might have the maturity of a six year old, and at the same time, some areas they might have a maturity of a sixteen year old. Right. Uh, let's just use the example of a ten year old that is intellectually gifted in mathematics, okay, and can perform on a sixteen year old level. Right. So. They could they could hold their own in a algebra two class with high school age peers, yep. but that doesn't mean they should go to the movies with those sixteen year old peers absolutely. because they don't have the emotional maturity. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and and we phrase that as schema. Right. So what do we know? So as adults, you know, we've been here for X number of years. We have that many years of experience. We have that huge framework of experiences mm -hmm. and knowledge and background. So case in point, even though you feel that you are arguing with a young adult. Seems like and a little mini adult, right? Exactly. They've there's, got the vocabulary. Yes, they've got the reasoning. Yes. They've got the memory. They can recall. <laughs> and as a teacher of gifted students, I've been sucked into that. Yeah. You know, and everyone does it because you feel like you're conversing with somebody that is on your level. Yeah. So it's so tempting, like yes. you said, to get sucked in and sort of want to argue with them as an adult. Yeah. But, but what do we have to remember? Well, that scheme is not there for them. Right. So we're going to be bringing in broader, uh, wider world perspectives that they may not see. And that's not fair. So what can you do? Well, you can kind of meet at their level, but also you can provide an opportunity for them to be with intellectual peers. Because they're going to more closely share schema. Absolutely. Right. So if they have a younger cousin who's six, but also on a 16-year-old intellectual mm -hmm. level, mm -hmm. get them together. Right. This is the chance that you could advance in classes and move up. And this is also the reason that we made New Minds. This is kind of a, one of our founding principles. Yeah, it's one kind of one of our pet concept is we developed this this idea of brain age we develop yeah. our courses according to the brain age of the student right when we, when we first started new minds the question was well how old does he have to be to be you know to, yeah. to be in this class yeah. and i was like well how old do you think he is yeah <laughs> you know we didn't want to use the arbitrary birth yeah. date like exactly how how old are you chronologically these are gifted kids right or what grade so. are you in so but we do design our courses having said that we design our courses with that maturity level in mind as well with the emotional well, yeah. yeah absolutely as well as the intellectual so. okay the book on this one, again, is Living with Intensity. This is the, we're on the third one, is that correct? Yeah, third one. So, mm -hmm. all right, next one. Moving along. Love this, this next one. category. Love this one. These one are the ones favorites. that give us our movies. These are the ones that give us our TV shows. This is the guy that made SpongeBob SquarePants. You know what I mean? <laughs> it had to be. <laughs> it had to be. <laughs> this is the person that is lost inside their own fantasy world. Yeah. Uh, zoning out. And on the outside, th these are the kiddos that may seem a little bit spacey, may mm -hmm. seem a little bit mm -hmm. out there. This might surprise the teacher when you tell him or her that that child's gifted. <laughs> that right? kid, the one that zones out all the time. Exactly. Right? They, but it's, it's not zoning out. I think that's that's part of why we're doing this is that it's a gift. It's a rich inner world that they're focused in My on. My goodness, right? they're painting pictures in their mind. Exactly. You know? They may have very vivid recall of their mm -hmm. dreams. Mm -hmm. um, literally truth and fiction sort of commingle in their mind mm -hmm. so you know it, sometimes people perceive this as you know they're they're lying or something like that but really it is just an intense commingling of truth and fiction to them it's as real as anything yeah. else is to you and i so how do we help them how do we help them harness sure, that sure. because it School with their multiple choice tests could be a real tough place for them, right? <laughs> Knock it off, bam! You have an overactive imagination, yeah, you know, right? Well, yeah. you know what? Now it's time to say thank you. You have an overactive imagination. You have an imaginational overexcitability, right? And 
is thank you because what you're doing is you're making something that is mundane interesting. Yes. You made this 14 hour car trip to Colorado interesting. Exactly. Because you were imaginative. Thank you. Um, so what, what can you do as a parent? Join in with their games. Right now, yeah. it's not going to hurt you. Indulge yes. them a little bit. Yes. When when it's, yes. you know, mornings are crazy. We have kids. We know cereals flying. Lunches are being packed. And I had those crazy dreams last night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Instead of brushing that off, indulge them for just a minute. Listen to that dream. Find some joy in that experience. Let them know that it's it's good. Yeah, absolutely. So then going back to that first one, um, I put down is provide divergent questions. Mm-hmm. So give us a give us a good example of sure, that. Sure, okay. Con- convergent just means that I'm converging all my thoughts into one answer. There's one right answer, right. and that's kind of not their way of operating. Yes. Divergent means that I'm able to diverge my thoughts anywhere I want to, and multiple, have multiple answers, answers are possible. So try this: you pick your kid up from school, and instead of saying something like "Well, how was school today?" instead you'll say, "Well." How'd your pencil do at school today? Did you enjoy the day in your pocket? Yeah. You know, what What did you do in class? And that's right on their frequency. They're going <laughs> to oh, jump right what? on that. <laughs> yeah. They will love that challenge. They'll probably even okay. like get out of the car and then go write a story about <laughs> it. You know what I mean? Like this, this right. is the type of kid it is. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's imaginational overexcitability. Okay. And I hope you begin to see a pattern that what you do is you acknowledge this and you accept this. And exactly. Things that you the can first say step is do. always that acknowledgement, that empathy. And this one goes back to, it's kind of a mingling of both the intellectual and the physical. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. For, well, let's talk about the emotional aspect as, first off. Sure, okay. There, this is a series of traits all related to a real intense emotional sensitivity with feelings, um, strong reactions and emotions. Mm-hmm. And this all kind of comes down to a physical manifestation, which is what we mean when we say strong somatic responses. So Yeah, versus psychosomatic, which is, oh, I... Uh, I am giving myself a fake illness, right like you right? imagine yeah. it like a yeah, hypochondriac yeah. or something this go. this is actually a real physical manifestation so this could be a stomach ache mm-hmm. every morning at 9 20 this student gets a stomach ache it's kind of a mystery might be perceived they're faking it to get out of something but really when you start to dig a little bit there's some emotional based cause you know what you raise your hand in class you ask a question you get it wrong that's embarrassing uh, and any kid's going to be embarrassed. When we say heightened, this is the kid that when they get it wrong, begin to cry, put right. their head down, the face turns red. Right. But the same token, they are also they have a lot of pride in what they do as well. So if something that they create is good, then they also attach them who they are to that. So I don't understand. So if we have these things that they're extremely sensitive, they're having psychosomatic responses. Um, do we mention some of those, like the sweaty palms, right? Yeah, yeah, stomach aches, sweaty palms, so blushing. What, what do you do? What do you do with that? Okay, well, number one, obviously, and especially important in this case, is that empathy, right? Acknowledging that. Like, you care you care so deeply. Mm-hmm. You have deep feelings. That's just so amazing. That's such a gift. I like this one thing you can do is help them develop a vocabulary to really yes. nurture this nuance of feeling. So instead of saying, instead of having them always fall back on, I'm happy or I'm sad, give them a 10-word vocabulary for how to say different forms of sadness. Sure. Yeah. I'm anxious, I'm feeling melancholy. Well, if you can't I'm, adequately describe how you feel and you're only re- resolving on you know sad or mad, that's, yeah. that's not going to qualify it enough. Right. Especially for someone that ha- has that kind of acute sense of emotion. Exactly. And help them sort of map those emotions to different things like what color, what color are you feeling like oh, today cool. or okay. what, what music best matches your mood today. You know, nice. so I'm nurturing that yeah. a little bit. Okay. And I, I like how you've talked a lot about this scenario practice. Sure. And I've, I've seen this one in application inside the classroom, which is why, which is why I borrowed it. And what you're doing is you're practicing scenarios. Okay. So you saw someone getting pushed over where their initial reaction was, you know, they were, they were so upset. They were so angry. So wait, are you saying like I could physically role play with my child? Like... I play the role of the bully. Sure, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So you're actually walking through these because what happens is they're not going to have an answer for you, or they're going to, you know, feel timid or shy and not and confused. Okay. But you actually practice. Well, you know, the third step down there is. So what are some possible reactions or some, some motives? What he mm-hmm. was doing. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe he didn't mean to. Maybe Timmy, you know, pushed her an accident at the locker. And so then, what's your appropriate response? Okay. And by beginning to form those words inside their mouth, they begin to find their own voice. Nice. And that's incredibly powerful for someone with emotional excitability, is the ability to express how they feel clearly and poignantly. Very nice. Yeah. And very deep and complex topic. Living with yes. intensity is yes. the place yes. to go for more. We just gave you just a tiny little crumb, to be honest with you, about how to help out with this overexcitability. 
There's a book, Living with Intensity. Okay. And just, uh, we kind of talked about this before, but we do want to emphasize this is based on the initial work of a psychiatrist in Poland, actually, named Dabrowski. This was early in the 20th century. And what's happened since then is modern researchers and, and specialists have taken his body of work and sort of translated it for the modern times. And so this book, Living with Intensity, is based on the work of Dabrowski. Um, Susan Daniels is the primary author. This is sort of a, a lifetime continuum that these overexcitabilities, we're not trying to give you coping mechanisms to sort of, quote, cure them. We're helping you, stage one right now is acknowledge and recognize them. But really, Dabrowski himself saw them as tools to sort of trigger self-development throughout life. And in fact, half of this book, Living with Intensity, is about overexcitabilities in adulthood. I mean, you, you and I are full of them. Yeah, that's why we're sitting here now, right? Okay. <laughs> there you go. All right. Okay, so moving on. We got uh, sure, more sure. stuff to do. Well, okay, so once again, these are manifestations. The reason they look different is this is a page straight out of the book. Exactly. Um, and, and I thought, what better way to use it than straight from the yeah. book mindset? Right, so we're transitioning to a new topic here, mindset. So let's talk about the manifestations here. Sure, okay. So when your child encounters or witnesses the success of others, do they feel threatened? Oh, or upset, you know. Are they upset ben by made that? this on the math test, and that's not fair. Yeah. You see how I'm like taking that externally and pointing that somewhere else. Right. Criticism. So, do they argue back with it? Do they completely ignore it? And then also, uh, effort. Do they see effort and like putting in their full potential? As, What's the uh, point? Yeah, we're supposed to, you know. Yeah, so. I'll never raise it anyway. <laughs> exactly. Right. Uh, do they get defensive and do they give up easily if they, if they mm -hmm. hit an obstacle? Mm -hmm. And then finally... When they have the choice of whether or not to face the challenge, will they avoid yeah. it? Yep. Okay, if because so... It's, it's safe right? to avoid it, right? Mm -hmm. It's safe mm -hmm. to avoid a challenge. What they have is they have a uh, fixed mindset. Right, and this is when they view their intelligence or their talent or their ability as something static. Yeah. Like, for some reason, it got into their head that this is just something you're born with. It's fixed. There's nothing I can do about it. So I better not do anything that shows that I don't got it. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. So if they're totally identified with their intelligence or whatever label it is. Sure. Right? I'm a super football player. I'm intelligent. I'm a great musician. Well, that's the perfect example. So if I tell you all the time, Ben, that you are a great musician, mm -hmm. the first time that you go to play a piece and you mess it up, well, then your entire sense of self-worth has just been destroyed. Because right. the only thing it's built on is the fact that you're able to play a piano. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my whole identity has basically just crumbled on my self-esteem. Yeah. Right, because I'm associated with that so idea in, that it's fixed and so static. So stop that. So stop, um, stop praising the fixed quality. Right. Stop praising the intelligence. Oh, you're so intelligent. You're so smart. Instead, praise the process. What are they doing? Well? Mm -hmm. It's not that they're smart. It's that they're, they're trying their hardest. It's, it's that you're mm -hmm. you're practicing every day on that piano. Praise the persistence. Praise uh -huh. the flexibility. When you right? mess up on when you mess up on the piano, you're not going to be like, oh, I I can't play the piano. You're going to say, you know what? I messed up, mm -hmm. but I know that I try real hard. Right. I'm going to continue to try real hard. Yeah. So. Exactly. And like slowly but surely, you can sort of reframe it in their mind. And they'll stop seeing it as fixed. And instead, they'll see the opposite, which is what we call the growth mindset. Now, let's kind of go back through that, that rubric that we just looked at about how the fixed mindset child reacts to all those situations. And what you'll see is when faced with these situations, such as obstacles or challenges, they'll embrace, you'll find they'll embrace them. Why? Because there are opportunities for growth and development. Well, and we put down persistence in the face of setbacks. This is the copy of the chart straight from the book. Mm -hmm. And how perfect that the book has parenting, business, school, and relationships on it. Yeah, I, I love how it covers all those spheres. It's, this is, if you decide to pick this one up, you'll be rewarded in many, many ways. It's beyond just parenting. But since we're focusing on the kids here, um, I mean, let's look at this chart. It's the opposite of the other one, right? They don't shy away from effort because they see it as how they're going to achieve mastery. Mm -hmm. When it comes to taking risk, for example, we all know how important risk taking is for growth and long term success. Well, a fixed mindset, they're not going to take risk because why? Well, it risks them shattering who they are. Exactly. Their perception. Yeah. But if you have a growth mindset, yeah, risk is a good idea. It's an opportunity to grow. Well, and what a perfect time to talk about Michael Jordan. He's the story inside this book as well, right? I mean, it wasn't... Junior in high school, okay. doesn't make the basketball team. If he had a fixed mindset... He would have walked away, uh -oh. right? Been over. Right? I guess, I guess that's just not me. Instead, for something innate within him, or maybe it was a mentor, maybe it was his dad, gave him that growth mindset. He was mm -hmm. over 
able to overcome those challenges and we all know what became of him <laughs> and actually what's interesting about michael jordan it wasn't just that one case that exceptional moment when he was in high school where he doubled up his efforts and made the team the next year and of course got recruited but you remember i don't know if you know this story about later in his career he took a little break and said, hmm, I think I'm going to try pro baseball. Yeah, I know, exactly. Right? Exactly. You know how yeah. that went? Yeah. It was a total disaster, <laughs> right? But after that, what did he do? He went back to pro basketball and finished off his career in a really successful way. He was yeah. driven by something beyond sort of this static view of himself yeah. and his talents. Okay, so this, this last one I want to get into is, um, it looks a little bit different. And what we have here, once again, these are areas that are heightened. You know, what kid doesn't yeah. want to go to school? Right. right. Sunday afternoon. <laughs> oh, so. tomorrow's Monday. I don't want to go. But uh, the picture in the middle is Richard Branson. Uh, the you founder remind of, us who he is? Yeah, yeah. Founder of uh, Virgin Mobile and okay. Virgin Records. And okay. Virgin Spaceship Travel now, right? Wow. He excelled in, in school as far as sports and being popular. Okay. But he just didn't fit in. His okay. parents knew that he was bright. His teachers knew that he was bright. But somehow this whole model wasn't fitting him. At the same time, at the age of 16 and 17, the man's making two different businesses. Right. So obviously <laughs> very talented, very yes. smart. Has but a just gift something and a passion. With, something with traditional yeah. school was just not clicking. Absolutely. Right? And what are the Beatles doing up here? Sure, yeah. Well, you know, just to give you one more here, though. Paul yeah. McCartney, he hated his music class in high school. Seriously? Paul McCartney? Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is the guy that um, would go into his music class and the teacher would come in, put on a gramophone. And then leave to go smoke a cigarette. Oh, nice. <laughs> so there you go. Times were different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that was his experience. And so, so clearly I, he wasn't connected inside the, the school field. That all way. right. So I, I'm seeing a pattern here. So obviously we know now Paul McCartney was an extraordinarily talented musician, a mm. smart guy. Yeah. But school just wasn't working for him. Absolutely. So th this seems to have something to do with uh, school being able to sort of nurture that sweet spot. Of talent yeah, and passion. Well, and what we're going to call it for the social emotional category yeah. is we're calling it missing the element. Okay. Um, just somewhere along the way that you are missing this balance between your passions, your knowledge, and your talents. Okay. And this is, of course, based on the work of Sir Ken Robinson. PhD, yes. Sir. From his book, The Elements. Uh -huh. And that's exactly like you mentioned, it's full of anecdotes of stories like that of these who we now know as talented, creative, successful people who just surprisingly when you look back at their school careers mm -hmm. did just not click with school absolutely right and, and sir Ken robinson himself he's a uh, educational philosopher and he gives a lot of great advice about how to sh you know shift the paradigm of education right and very very inspiring book we were both you know turned on by this book and inspired by mm -hmm. it but what we found is it was very very difficult to apply it to the ins and outs of working with individual students yeah, so we wanted to kind of bring it down to, to street level, so to speak, and say, okay, we love this philosophy, we agree, we want to change the system, but right now, what can we do with the student in front of us? How do we bring him or her into that so-called sweet spot mm -hmm. so we're going to be nurturing their element? And so that's where we developed this sort of system of this triple Venn diagram you see, the passions, knowledge, talent, we call it the PKT for short, totally based on the work of Sir Ken Robinson. Help walk me through this, Justin. Sure. So, well, what you're looking for is you're looking for a balance between all three. That's the ideal sweet spot right in the middle. That PKT sure. right in the sure. middle where my passions and my knowledge and my talents are all reinforced mm -hmm. well, you and know, coinciding. And to use the book, The Element, to talk about it, he gave some case studies of people that were successful in business. They had a talent for it, and they knew what they were doing, okay. but their heart wasn't in the right spot, and so right. they left and pursued a different different avenue. Okay. Um, that's what you're going to find. I mean, someone yeah. that is really talented with the piano and has a lot of knowledge about that kind of stuff, but does it, not enjoy playing it, right? they're going to quit. You know. Okay. They're, but like, let's bring this even closer to home. Speaking of the piano, I know... You have oh, you, sure, you love sure. the piano and you you're a genius of music theory, but you always complain about you're not very good. So what? How would you place yourself there? Sure, I would say that I have a high passion for learning. Okay. You know, I'm very in, intrinsically motivated to want to play the piano. Okay. Um, you have music, I, you I, have I, the I, knowledge. I, 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 so I'm putting you. you there in the PK category. Yeah, but so, I don't have actually the ability to, to tickle the ivories. You know, yeah. pound out some chords. So how do I bring you to your sweet spot? It sounds sure. like you need sure. a mentor. You need the right match. You need the right teacher mm -hmm. who works at the right intensity at the right pace to sort of pull you down into that sweet spot by developing that talent absolutely right you mentioned the pk in that regard and we've talked about the uh the kt the other one would be if you have a 
heightened passion and talent, but no knowledge. Now that sounds a little bit obvious. Let me yeah. explain. Yeah. What you have is I see this a lot in, in boys that are interested in computers. They love computers. They love computer programs. Um, they can play video games for hours on end. They're interested in how they're made. They even want to be, you know, a game designer someday. And they might have a knack for sort of that logical inferencing yeah. or that algorithmic thinking. Absolutely. Ideal for programming, right? Yeah. But then ask them, you know, to read computer program code or ask them to put together a website and they don't have a clue. Mm-hmm. Um, so what you have is you have no knowledge in that area. So why not strengthen their passions and their talents yeah. and cultivate those things right. by providing some of that knowledge? In a way, that's one of the easiest scenarios because, well, the passion and the talent are there. Yeah. <laughs> you can teach them anything. Yeah. You know, they're going to have the battle. Exactly. So. Um, but yeah, so what we do is as we're trying to gauge our students' passions, knowledge, and talents, we always like to ask this question. Um, the last time you said, I want to try that, what was that? And we get the most amazing response. Yeah, it's wonderful. I kind of think of it as the kid version of, you know, if you had a billion dollars and unlimited time, what would you do, right? Mm -hmm. In this case, it's remove those mental limitations and try to get at the the essence of what the kid is really naturally passionate about. And you get, like you said, we get some surprising answers that even surprise the parents sometimes. Sure. Well, then what what can you do as a parent at that point? Again, you're attempting to identify where those areas are and where the passion exists. And then once you find it, enrich it. So if, if they're interested in that area, like computer programming, then, you know, find a, a computer programming course, you know, like the one you put together, or right. one in your area, and provide them opportunities to cultivate that understanding that that may be outside of school. Exactly. Um, and then that's, you know, the cases, the three cases or two cases that we talked about at the onset of this part of the presentation were cases where it wasn't met in school. Yeah. Right? Paul yeah. McCartney and Richard Branson. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay, so this has been um, our attempt to provide solutions to the social-emotional puzzle. I say that because what a wealth of information. Yeah, it's a big, and, complex and, yeah, topic full of subtleties and nuances. And exactly. <laughs> digging in. What we hope that you have gotten out of this is the ability to at least provide yourself a category or some kind of name to associate with the manifestations and characteristics of each uh, of your child. And then, most importantly, so that you have some things that you can say and do, and also some research that you can read up on. Right. And another thing we want to bring up is that you, as the parent, probably have a lot of wisdom on one or more of these topics as well. So oh, please, more than us. If yeah. You want to ask For the us, opportunity so. to sort of benefit other parents, we've developed a couple of conversation streams on our Facebook page related directly to this presentation. Mm-hmm. So we really encourage you to kind of go out there and give your two cents or even ask your question, ask for some more advice. If it's something more sensitive, you can follow up with us directly, of course. You have the annotated bibliographies there. We encourage you to dig deeper. Thanks so much for joining us and please stay tuned. There's gonna be many more opportunities to learn with us. Check us out at uh, numian.com, N-U-M-I-E-N.com. All right, I'm Justin Botter. And I'm Ben Cook. Thanks for tuning in.